What's up guys, it's River, and in this video, I'm gonna show you guys how to get every ounce of horsepower out of your A6600 and turn this camera into an absolute beast. And chances are, if you have one of these cameras, you already know a thing or two. So this tutorial is going to have absolutely zero fluff, just useful information. My hope is that I can save you guys a whole lot of time and energy by showing you exactly how to set up your camera and avoid some of the mistakes that I made when I got this camera, but most importantly, show you guys how to fix some of the dreaded issues with this camera. By the way, if you're new to the channel, we talk about anything and everything to do with camera gear, including teaching you guys how to take better photos and videos with the camera you already have. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you wanna see more of this content. And I'm gonna leave links down below for all of the gear that we talk about today. Let's get into the video. So let's get into the menus and I'm gonna walk you guys through and show you exactly how I set my camera up. All right, so let's get right into it. You'll notice this menu looks slightly different if it's in video mode versus vi uh, photo mode. Right now it's in photo mode and let's just go over some of the basic settings in case some of you guys do not know, please be patient for the newer guys but raw raw or JPEG. Personally, I like to shoot both, especially nowadays the cards are so big, but a lot of you guys may just wanna shoot with raw to save space. JPEG quality, extra fine. JPEG image size, 24 megapixels naturally. Uh, this way you're gonna get the most amount of megapixels. There's no advantage to lowering this number. One thing that I do wanna to quickly touch upon is that if you're shooting aspect ratio, if you're gonna shoot three by two, you're gonna get the most amount of your sensor. You're gonna get the biggest image possible, but if you plan to crop it later to one by one for Instagram or 16 by nine, you can actually shoot it in one by one. And what will actually happen is you can uncrop your image in Lightroom because with the raw, when you shoot raw, it gives you the full image, but it'll just give you a pre-crop. So you can uncrop it. Most people don't know that. But back to this. So one thing that I often tell people is that this high ISO noise reduction, you actually wanna set to off. Unless you're shooting at something crazy high like 32,000, keep it off because you don't want this camera to do any kind of noise reduction for you. It's always better to do it in post. And then right after that, color space, lens comp, just leave that as to where it is. Uh, drive mode, what I, it, it's really gonna depend on what you're shooting, but let's quickly go over drive modes. But so if you're in single shooting mode, you know, it's one photo at a time, but for drive modes, low, you'll get about three to five frames per second, high, high plus. Um, that's quite a lot of frames and you're gonna get the full 11 frames per second. Personally, I like to shoot at just drive mode mid. I find it gives me the best results. Because an issue that I often have is that if I shoot on a drive mode like high plus, I just end up with way too many photos and if I don't need that many photos, I'm often looking at photos that are nearly identical and it just wastes my time. So personally, I like to shoot on mid unless I really need to set it to high plus. Now next up, let's talk about autofocus. So one of the things that I often have people ask me, they're like, well, what autofocus mode is the best? Like, should it be AFS, AFA? And my answer to everybody is just set it to AFC, which is continuous. This will make sure that your autofocus is always going with you. It's always tracking. There's really no advantage to having your autofocus set to something else because in AF automatic, it's gonna try to pick the autofocus mode for you. In some rare cases, single shot might be helpful if you're kind of picking your focus and then holding it on something, maybe if you're doing product photography, but I really do find autofocus continuous is the best. There's also autofocus DMF where it will allow you to use autofocus to focus on something and then uh, work the autofocus dial to later fine tune your autofocus. This is really useful for macro photography or uh, product photography, but personally, I never really find myself using this. And manual autofocus is really just manual autofocus. Um, if you're gonna get a Sony camera, don't use manual mainly because the whole point of this camera is how good the autofocus is. And for the next two settings, I would just leave it at balance emphasis. It's going to give you the best looking autofocus. Now here's the tricky part, focus area. Now this will depend on exactly what you're shooting. If you're shooting something wide, landscape, maybe a person walking towards the camera, wide is the best way to do it because that's going to make sure that your camera looks at everything and it tries to pick out what what it should be focused on. Uh, zone, basically what it does, it, it tries to pick different parts of your sensor, like okay, maybe we're picking the lower left, lower right. This can be really, really useful 
if you know your subject's going to be stuck in one specific spot or if you're trying to get a specific composition. And lastly, there's center. Now this is just going to pick the absolute center of your camera and uh, just make that your autofocus point. One thing that I wish was possible is that if I could have a flexible, well, if I could put my center in other places, but that's kind of the point of flexible spot, is that you can put your center in other places and it will just look at other things. And then there's expandable ex flexible spot. Personally, I don't really use this. And the whole idea is that you can make that spot that it's looking at wider or smaller. I find this is something that I never really use and I find uh, center and wide to be my bread and butter. But one thing that I do wanna mention, if you're shooting mostly video with this camera, keep your autofocus on continuous and your uh, focus area on wide. And it doesn't matter if you're shooting people, dogs, cars, it will always make sure everything is in focus. And it does a really good job at figuring out what should be in focus. With autofocus in this camera, it really is set it and forget it. I wouldn't overcomplicate it too much, especially in video mode. Now, next up in the next page, you'll see something called pre-AF. I like to make sure that is off. I find it really annoying when my camera's trying to autofocus before I've even gone to autofocus. It's super annoying, keep that off. And one thing that I would make sure to keep on is AF with shutter. It doesn't matter if it's for video or photos. This way, if you kind of half press your shutter button, it will make sure to get autofocus. And the other thing that I like to do is AF illuminator. Now, I usually like to keep this off, but sometimes if I'm in a low light situation, it's helpful to keep this on. And one thing that I do want to mention, when it comes to the face and eye detect autofocus settings, I would leave them exactly where they are. They're in a really good place, unless you're shooting something with animals, uh, in which case I would recommend going to subject detection and changing it to animals, but really it's perfect where it is. Okay, with that being said, let's talk about the video portion of this. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into our menus and make sure we're, we're on the second tab up here. This way we know we're in video settings. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure it's set to manual exposure. The other exposure modes are for amateurs. You wanna make sure you're in manual control. And because of that, exposure mode will be grayed out. Okay, so let's talk about file format. So there you're gonna have three options, XAV, XAVCS, 4K, XAVC, SHD. Now these are the file formats that you wanna use. AVC HD is a really crappy file format. I wouldn't use it unless you're really trying to save space, but even then SD cards are huge now. There's really no reason. This is like a toy camera format. If you wanna do anything serious with this camera, cause obviously if you have a 6600, you're probably gonna be editing your footage. You wanna make sure you use XAVSC. Um, I'm not gonna switch over to 4K because it's going to interrupt the recording with the external recorder. But one thing that I wanna talk about is that when you go into record setting, you're gonna have two options. You're either gonna have 50 mil, uh, megabits per second or 25 megabits per second. Uh, always pick 50. Um, you know, if I learn anything in math class is pick the higher number. And if you're doing this in 4K mode, you're gonna have an option of either picking 50 megabits per second or 100 megabits per second pick the higher megabit rate, but one thing to mention, that is not only going to take up more space, it's also going to be a lot harder on your computer, so make sure that if you're gonna pick the higher format that you have a pretty decent editing computer. Okay, next up, let's quickly talk about SNQ settings. SNQ mode is a mode that I don't really love to use, but sometimes it can be useful. Basically what it does is it shoots slow-mo for you and slows it down within camera. This is only useful if you actually wanna see what the slow-mo looks like in camera. Personally, I don't think it's really something you should use too often, mainly because I find, for the most part, SNQ mode does not have the same high quality as just shooting it at 120 frames per second internally and slowing it down later in post. Plus, by shooting it at 120 frames per second internally, you also keep your audio track. Um, I think this is only useful in specific cases, like if you're doing product shots, or if you're doing some kind of slow-mo commercial. Other than that, I wouldn't really use it, but let's talk about how to set it up. You wanna make sure your record setting is set to 24. This is going to give you the most amount of slow motion, and especially 24 if this is um, where what, what your project frame rate will be. Uh, some of you guys might be shooting in 30 frames per second based on, depending on where you're based out of, but I tend to go with 24. And then you wanna set your frame rate to 120 frames per second, and this way you're gonna get slow motion in camera. There's also a way to do time lapse with this mode, which is you go into 24, um, you pick that setting, and then you actually go to a lower frame rate. I like 15, and this way what it'll actually do is it'll shoot less frames than what you're gonna play back at, and this will 
uh, speed up. It will basically give you quick motion, as Sony likes to call it. And this will basically speed up the video. It'll give you a really nice time lapse in camera, but once again, it's not going to look as good as if you shot like thousands of raw, raw photos with this camera and then put them together in Premiere, but this is a nice way to save time. I'm actually going on vacation in about a week or so. I plan to shoot time lapses, but I'm lazy. I'm probably gonna use SNQ mode. And another thing is proxy recording. If you are someone that struggles with editing and you're like, man, my computer really can't handle this stuff, proxy recording is really, really helpful. It will actually record 720p low quality versions of your final clip. And what you can actually do is edit that low proxy version, which is easy for your laptop or your iPad, whatever have you. And then you just simply swap out the files in Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro, and then it'll compile that edit. And it's not very seamless, but it's a lot easier than working with large files that are super slow on your computer. Next up, let's talk about drive speed because this is very important. Autofocus drive speed. Now, this is really going to depend on what you're shooting. If you're someone that's doing a lot of running gun stuff and you need your autofocus to be fast and quick, I like to set this to fast. But the thing is, it's literally gonna go from like zzz, 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 zzz. It feels like a robot. If you're doing anything that's mildly cinematic or maybe a commercial, I would recommend setting it to normal or even slow because otherwise your focus pulls are gonna look very unnatural and very robotic. I always leave autofocusing sensitivity to standard. I find it's great where it is. Responsive can sometimes be a little too responsive. Now, here's another thing I really want you guys to watch out for, and this is one of the issues with this camera. So you probably noticed that to hit record or get the video mode running, you have to hit this tiny little red button on the back of your camera, and it's not convenient and it's kind of annoying to hit. If you go down to movie with shutter, turn this on, basically when you're in movie mode and you hit the shutter button, it will just record for you, voila. And now if you're someone that's planning to shoot something cinematic or commercial like with this camera, or you simply like to add those black bars at the top and bottom of your video, one thing that I love to do for composition reasons is I like to turn marker display on, marker settings, and then from there, I will go into aspect and I'll just figure out what aspect ratio I'm shooting on. This is really helpful, especially if you're shooting for social media, Instagram, and you wanna shoot vertical. This way you're like, okay, four by three, I know exactly where the four by three is. You can add safety zone, guide frames, but this makes it super, super easy to compose if you know you're gonna be editing your video later on. Also, if you're watching this video, chances are you already own an A6600 and you're pretty serious about your camera work. Did you know that you can actually turn the camera that you already own into an asset that's going to make you money every single month? Because in the Side Hustle Pro course, we take the average user that simply has a casual interest or a passion for photography and video, and we help them use the camera that they already own and turn that into a high paying side hustle. And we do all of this without having to spend thousands of dollars on new camera equipment or months learning how to start the business. So if you're interested in taking the camera that you already own and turning it into an asset that makes you money every single month, make sure to check out the Side Hustle Pro course in the link down below and I will see you in the course. Let's get back into the video. And we're back. I might look a little bit different, but that's because I had a haircut employment. Either way, let's get back into the video. Let's talk about one of the most important things for when it comes to setting up your camera, and that is your picture profile. Now, right off the bat, this camera is going to look just okay, but if you really wanna get the most out of this camera, picture profiles is where it's at. So what exactly is a picture profile? Now, what a picture profile actually does is pretty complicated and different types of profiles do different things. But simply put, it's a tuning of your sensor so that it sees the same light, but it interprets it or as it records it as footage in a different way. Basically using specific picture profiles is gonna give you more dynamic range, which is the distance between your brightest point in the image and your darkest point in the image. You'll get more of that soft cinematic look. You can adjust your picture profile to see colors differently, to see shadow detail differently, see highlights differently. They all do different things, but I'm gonna talk about a couple of different picture profiles that you would use for different scenarios. One for someone that's just trying to turn stuff around quickly. One that's for someone that's trying to make something very commercial, very like music video like, something where like you're like, damn, this really needs to look good. I really need to color grade this. And someone that's trying to create a very soft cinematic look, like something for a short film. All right guys, so let's take a look at setting up your picture profile. So right off the bat, we're gonna go into your menus. Now this will be menu page tab one, page 14. And you wanna make sure 
DRO HDR optimizer is set to auto. It's gonna do a fantastic job at auto. Um, and then you wanna go back into your menus once it's set and make sure your creative style is set to standard, picture effect is off and picture profile is what we're gonna be adjusting. So right off the bat, you'll see these 10 tabs. Now, you can pretty much go into any of these. These are all blank containers that, you know, are come pre-set up from the factory, but I've gone ahead and messed with them just for funsy. Let's go with PP10. Kinda sounds funny, PP. It's, it's, a, it's a weird thing to name your stuff, Sony. So let's take, a, the let's take a look at the first case usage. If you're someone that's just going to turn it around very quickly, just overnight, you're like, bam, let's shoot this, edit it out to the client. Doesn't need to be anything fancy. Um, for that, what I recommend doing is going into gamma and changing this to movie mode. Now I will talk about what exactly gamma is in a second, but I just wanna quickly explain this. And then you wanna make sure color mode is set to movie and that's it. What I do recommend doing is just setting your saturation to plus two, just so that the colors look nice and poppy. But some of you guys may just wanna do that in post during your editing process. But uh, you know, if it's a really quick turnaround, sometimes you don't even have time for that. And next up, let's take a look at what different settings in this do. So gamma is basically the way your camera is interpreting the light hitting the sensor and it's choosing how to see it and choosing what kind of file to give you, or rather what kind of an image to give you. So the file format always stays the same, but exactly what's in that file, that's going to change. So gamma is, I guess we can think of as like the tuning on our sensor. It's not changing the colors for us. It's determining how it's interpreting the light. So the two things I wanna look at is if you're shooting a music video or a commercial and you need a lot of dynamic range and you want like a cool poppy look, um, you really wanna be able to grade your image easily, really finesse the colors. For something like that, I recommend Cinema 4. Now, Cinema 4 is going to give you a really wide dynamic range, and it's going to give you the ability to really push and pull your shadows and has a really beautiful highlight roll off. And for color mode, now you would think, let's just go with cinema colors, but not exactly. What you wanna do is you wanna go with ITU709 matrix. Now, this is going to give you colors that are pretty easy to handle. It's going to still give you a lot of flexibility in your colors, but it's going to give you pretty easy to handle colors that won't require a whole bunch of push and pull in something like DaVinci Resolve. You could easily handle these colors and do a grade if you're doing something like a mid-tier or, or a mid-tier mid -tier music video or mid-tier commercial, and you could easily do your grade in Premiere Pro or Final Cut. Uh, again, you wanna make sure for something like this, you actually have your saturation set to negative five. Now there's two scenarios here. If you're someone that's doing a commercial that maybe something similar to like a car commercial, just has that aesthetic, or like a Facebook commercial, an Apple commercial, I would set the saturation to negative five. This will give you more room to add saturation and play with the vibrance and saturation, just like the overall poppiness of your colors. But if you're doing something that has maybe like a neon aesthetic or a cyberpunk aesthetic like this image up here, what you'll see is that you actually wanna do a negative 10 saturation because this way you have like almost no color information. It's like very, very little color information and then that way you just have more flexibility to add more saturation, add more stuff. But one thing that I do want you guys to be, um, I guess, aware of is that because it's 8-bit color, the more you push your file, the quicker it will fall apart. So if you're gonna do something like negative 10 saturation, you really wanna make sure you dial in your lights and the colors for your lights as much on set and in post, you're really just trying to finesse the luminance values and the hues of your color. Actually, sorry, I misspoke. You're not dialing in the hues of your color, but you're just dialing in the saturation for your colors. You wanna make sure your hues are pretty much dialed in on set. And the last thing you wanna do is you wanna go down to detail and set detail to negative seven. Now this is something I believe in for basically any kind of cinematic profile or really anything you need for a Sony camera. You wanna set this as low as possible because sharpness is something where these cameras, like a mirrorless camera like this, or a DSLR is already very, very, very sharp. What you really wanna do is take out as much sharpness as you can because that's what detail really is adding. It's adding sharpness. What you wanna do is take it out and you can easily put it back in post. You can easily put it back in the editing process. It's literally just one slider, but, you, but once you have the sharpness in there, you can not take it out. And last but not least, I wanna talk about a cinematic profile that gives you a ton of control over your skin tones. Now that is, you wanna go down to HLG3. 
Now, when it comes to something where you're like cinematic skin tones, a lot of dynamic range, a lot of people tend to gravitate towards S-Log2, S-Log3, which honestly, of course they would because S-Log2 and S-Log3 are like Sony's premier profiles. All the big cameras have them. But the issue is those profiles are really made for 10-bit cameras because these are what is known as a logarithmic profile. I'm not gonna take time to explain what it is. It's so nerdy, it will like hurt your brain. But these things, are really made for cameras that have a much higher color depth, something like a 10-bit or a 12-bit uh, camera. But since this is an 8-bit camera, you're often going to have trouble with noise, banding, just a ton of issues. And I think if you know how to edit S-Log2 and S-Log3, like you're a pro at it, you can do some amazing work. But for like the average person that isn't a colorist by trade, I think it's too much work and I think it's just a headache. What I personally like to do is go with HLG3. This is going to give you similar skin tones to S-Log2. It's going to give you really nice soft S-Log2 skin tones. It's going to give you a beautiful highlight roll off. It's going to give you much more of that cinematic look. If you're trying to make a narrative film or something with just like a very soft, vintage like movie-like look to it, this is what I recommend, specifically because of the skin tone and how dramatically that highlight roll off shifts. Um, if you're a cinematographer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And when you go down to color mode, you wanna set this to BT2020. Now, some people prefer 709. I would say do a few tests, but with BT2020, you're going to get a very wide dynamic range, and I think the colors are much more usable and easier to adjust than 709, where I personally, in my testing, I found 709 was pretty restrictive. Uh, but again, it depends on your style of grading, your style of cinematography. Um, but I personally like uh, BT2020, and then once again, saturation, I would set this to negative five or negative 10, depending on exactly what you're doing, and go down to detail and set this to negative seven, and once that is done, you are good to go. So once again, to quickly recap, if you're doing quick turnaround, use movie mode for both cam gamma and color depth. If you're doing a commercial or a music video, use Cinema 4 with IUT color depth, uh, sorry, co uh, colors, and if you're doing a cinematic grade, you want it to look very movie-like, use HLG3 with BT2020 colors. And there's one really key thing that I wanna show you guys because it is going to help fix a big, big, big issue with this Sony camera. And honestly, most Sony cameras. And that is the menu systems suck. So because of that, we're actually gonna go all the way to the top tab and we're gonna go all the way to the left or the right depending on how you wanna do it, but you'll get to something called My Menu. And as you look into this My Menu, you're like, wow, this menu is so nice. This is everything I need in one, one place. It's almost like it's your menu, haha. -ha. But basically, I do recommend setting up My Menu. It's really easy to set up. You just go to the last page. It'll be like, add item. And let's just say I wanna add autofocus drive speed. And depending on what I wanna do, cause it'll give you, if you press left and right, you can choose which page you wanna have it on or even what uh, picture, what setting to replace it with. But let's just say I wanna replace it with manual focus assist, assist, and you can say override, or you can go, uh, if you hit menu, let me go back to add item, and I'm just gonna pick a random one, wind noise reduction, and then I'll add this right here. And just like that, you've got a menu. And if you ever wanna like move things around, you can simply go to sort item, and you can sort your items. but my menu is going to make your life a whole lot easier. It's going to make your workflow a lot easier, especially when you're on the set and people are yelling at you. I'm always getting yelled at on set. But basically, it's going to make your workflow that much faster with your camera, especially in a high pressure environment. So I do recommend setting up your My Menu. All right, guys, that's pretty much it for the Sony A6600 tutorial. If you guys have any questions about this camera whatsoever, let me know in the comments down below and I'll make sure to get back to every single one of you. I wanna make sure I help you guys get the most out of this camera. And if this video did help you, please make sure to leave a like. It helps the video, it helps me keep making more of this content for you guys. And if you wanna learn how to take the camera that you already own and have it make money for you every single month, make sure to check out the Side Hustle Pro course in the link down below. And I will either see you in the course or in the next video. Peace.